Morgan State and the University of Maryland's joint spring practice, a.k.a. Baltimore Day, will do a great job of making sure HBCU athletes get in front of scouts earlier in the process. Oh, yeah, it's locked on HBCU. Play my music. You are locked on HBCU, your daily podcast covering HBCU sports. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. going on family welcome back to another episode of the locked on hbcu podcast your number one daily one-stop shop for everything hbcu athletics monday through friday part of the locked on podcast network your team every day and i of course sam darian gray aka the mouth of the south texas southern alum and former tsu herald sports editor and current contributing writer at usa today's saints wire Thank you for going on this journey with me, making Locked On HBCU your first listen of the day every day. And remember, just because the mic cuts off does not mean that the journey is over. Just means it's time to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. Starts with an S and ends with an S. Today's episode is brought to you by Nissan. And are you the kind of driver that always likes to push things further to or to their farthest limit? If either one of those things are true and you wonder what adventure can be around the corner from you, take the Nissan Rogue, Pathfinder, or Armada and go find your next big adventure. Check them all out at NissanUSA.com. We'll wrap up today's episode with a look at Star Jacobs, who is transferring from UAPB without even playing a game for the Lady Lions. I think that one's interesting. Prior to that, we'll be looking at Grambling, who had a historic first year with head coach Courtney Simmons, and one that should be acknowledged and praised, so who better to do it? But we kick today's episode off with Morgan State and the University of Maryland in their joint spring practice that will be happening next Saturday. So that is April 6th. You'll have that event next Saturday. It's going to be called Baltimore Day. And I kind of like it. I'm not going to be, I'm not even going to lie to you. I'm going to be honest. I think that this has a lot of room to be a phenomenal event. I think that the intentions are aligned with the growth of HBCUs and also getting HBCUs HBCU football players noticed, right? And that may seem a little bit dramatic, but that's the intent. And I think that it will have the effect as long as the players perform, right? Like all of these conversations about what players need to do to be, all of it revolves around players having to perform. I almost feel like that's the silent part because it doesn't matter how many HBCU combines that you have. It doesn't matter how many times you go over to the biggest colleges pro day. If I go... What's the biggest? What's the biggest college to me? You let's say UNT. If I go to the UNT pro pro day, well, let's say UT because UT is bigger, right? If I go to the University of Texas at Austin's uh, University of Texas at Austin pro day, if I go there and I jump a ten inch vertical and I run a five five forty, it does not matter that I was at the University of Texas at Austin's pro day. That that's that becomes irrelevant. So it doesn't matter how many combines and mixed pro days you have. It doesn't matter how many money games you have in which you can perform. None of those things matter if the players don't perform. And I think that that's understood. So it doesn't need to be said, but I decided to say it this time in particular. This is called Baltimore Day because it'll actually be it in Morgan State's home stadium, Hughes Memorial, and they're way closer to Baltimore than University of Maryland is, but it's at Morgan State. So it's okay, right? Like it works out. And the thing about this that I think is beautiful is that these schools don't have long history. I don't know what the relationship is in basketball, but in football, this is a team or two teams that have only faced off once in their school history. And that was in 2010. So it's not as if these two teams have a rich history of facing each other. This is just... This is just a partnership kind of formed out of two coaches who were forward thinking. And it probably took some selling to get University of Maryland to say, we're going to drive an hour up the road and go to Morgan State. It probably didn't take too much for Morgan State because this is very beneficial to them. But this is University of Maryland really taking that that shot of going up. It's 
is similar to a money game in these two aspects. One, you don't have money games at your home. Right. You don't get to you don't get to say University of Maryland, you're coming up to Morgan State and pay us the cash. Like that's not how it happens. So it's kind of similar to that in the sense that with basketball, we praise the home and home because you get to have them come to your arena. So that's the one similarity there. And then the second similarity for me is the intent that we're looking at. I'm not going to be on Maryland's nuts and say that, yeah, they're going to be looking at 32 scouts looking them in their eye. I don't know what kind of talent is at the University of Maryland. I don't know what kind of talent is there currently, right? I just don't know. But I can I can bank that there's going to be a few scouts. I don't know how many. It won't be 32. Like, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say that they're the University of Georgia. I'm not going to say they're Alabama. Like, but there's going to be some scouts there. And that's the, the mission, is that the scouts that are there from Maryland, now that it's in that same place, you can now be there for the for the Morgan State athletes, right? Morgan State is performing or is practicing from 11 to 1.30, and then Maryland is performing, practice, I don't want to say perform so much, but it's practicing from 2 to 4.30, and after each practice, there'll be a meet and greet. This is what I love about this. When I say you're getting your players in front of these scouts' eyes earlier, I love the HBCU Combine, but one of the biggest problems with the event is not the actual running of the event. It's the fact that these scouts, I ain't going to say nine times out of ten, but I got real information. These scouts don't know about these players until they get there. That's a problem. If we're talking about January, February, and you're just now getting on a scout's radar, your draft profile, the rise that we can get out of it, very limited. But if I'm a freshman or a sophomore, right, maybe I'm an early enrollee, maybe I'm a second-year player, look at Todd Smith at Morgan State, the quarterback. If he performs well, now eyes are on Todd Smith. And let's let's not get it twisted. Scouts don't really go to HBCUs a lot. That's the problem. They're not getting eyes out there. But they do look when they're around. And I know that there's players who have caught scouts' eyes in a way that will lead to them keep coming back. Let's not talk about HBCU athletes and their lack of getting drafted to make you think that there's no HBCU players who are pulling scouts to their game. Jatiah Carter had scouts who were coming to Southern to see Jatiah Carter. But the thing is, we got to get that attention. That's what it is. You have to get that attention. And this is the perfect time. I think this is the perfect way to get it. You're not going up against Maryland. So that's a little bit of a a downside because, you know, they always want to say, what can you do against big name talent, big school talent? So you don't get that. But you are going to be there and they can see the practices. And one thing I learned from going to the Shrine Bowl this year is watching how the teams dwindle down when you talk about not the East and the West team, but the the teams from the NFL and their representation. Once it came down to the last day of practice, nobody was there. That's what they care about. They care about the days of practice so much so that the last day in the game, irrelevant. So if I can see Morgan State in the practice and I can see how coachable that these players are, it's beautiful. So let me just sum up the biggest thing about this. To me, Morgan State and University of Maryland having a joint spring practice is very similar, not the same, but very similar to a money game in the sense that it's time for you to get out there and catch the scouts' eyes who are there, you know, for the bigger schools because that's typically how it is, but you're not being neglected in this situation. Even if you're just getting some collateral, a little bit of a little bit of a residual, you're in the building, right? And that that's what matters. It's like when they tell you, hey, man, once you get there, that's all that matters. Just how you get there is how, how you get there. It doesn't matter. Just as long as you get there and then you can show what you got. That's how I look at this. That's exactly how I look at this. The big difference between this and the HBCU combine, which is both meant to achieve the same goal, is now you're getting players in front of scouts eyes maybe two years before they go into the draft cycle instead of two, three months before they get into the draft cycle. I have no nothing but respect for what the HBCU combine is doing. I just think that there's a cap on what you can do when most of these scouts don't care about these players until that day. This is the time to get them in there earlier. So I appreciate that. And as we push forward, let's look at Grambling. Grambling women's basketball had a phenomenal season. First year under Courtney Simmons. And we need to highlight how legendary that year one was. And we'll do that as we continue with Locked On HBCU. 
This week's March Madness bracket is brought to you and highlighted by our friends at Nissan. Each week, we're picking one team that stands out and the team that pushes it farther than the rest, just like any of the all-new 2024 Nissan SUVs. These guys were able to take it to the next level. The North Carolina Tar Heels can only be described as an armada. This number one seed is as hardcore as it gets. As it gets out there, we are going to look at this team as a blue blood, but then also maybe one of the best teams in this year's bracket. It's no wonder that they, secure, they secured a spot in the Sweet 16 this Thursday against Alabama in the NCAA tournament, and they are the favorite picked by many to make a run for the championship. So take the Nissan Rogue, take the Nissan Pathfinder, take the Nissan Armada, and go find your next big adventure. doesn't matter if you want to get e either one of those three. They're all going to allow you to push your limits and look for your next big adventure. All you have to do is shop NissanUSA.com. Today's episode is also brought to you by Better Together, and I love Better Together because I'm not one of those people who is phenomenal when it comes to daily fantasy sports. That's just not my thing, but it does offer a familiar, like, familiar experience while also having a nice little twist because it allows you to be social. It allows you to play with a friend. It provides you a sense of camaraderie and also a little bit of assistance because we all have that friend who's really good at fantasy. And you're just like, man, I don't know how to beat this guy. You don't have to beat them anymore. All you have to do is partner with them. Say, hey, show me your ways. Give me the synergy of working together and give you a better chance at winning than going at it alone. Your bracket may be already busted. That's fine. Doesn't even matter because this is irrelevant in this situation. All you have to do is pick the more or the less on real-time player stats. Tra strategize with your partner. Boost your odds. Climb the leaderboard together. Because in, if you ask me, winning alone, it's fun. I like it. But it's always been better together. As we continue rolling on today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day. Every day for your second listen, make sure you're checking out Locked on Sports Today. The first of its kind, 24-7, all-day, everyday sports show on YouTube, live on Locked on Sports Today. I want to look at Grambling State women's basketball because they've bowed out. Their season is over. They had their uh, last game in the WNIT after losing the University of Louisiana and Monroe. And this really does cap off a legendary first season for Courtney Simmons, the new head coach. So when you look at what she was able to do, I believe that Courtney Simmons's first year at Grambling will go down as one of, if not the greatest first year. And I know that there's a little bit of hype attached to it. So we'll just say one of, right? But when you look at what she was able to do after coming into a 10 and 20 team, this is a team that lost twice as many games as they had won in 2023. And in a matter of a year, she took them from being that to being the number two seed in the SWAC tournament. This was a dramatic turnaround. And I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be honest with you. I think that Coach Simmons has a legit argument for SWAC coach of the year. I don't think I would have picked her. But if somebody would have came up to me and said, hey, Coach Simmons at Grambling had a SWAT Coach of the Year caliber season. There is no way I can argue with that. I think that Tamika Reed going undefeated probably takes the cake because you didn't lose a game. I get that. But when you look at what Simmons was able to do in her first year at Grambling, I don't know she didn't win it, but it's hard to say that she didn't have a season that was worthy of it, right? It's like, it's like two players who broke the passing record in the same year. Somebody had to get the MVP. Somebody had to get the MVP. But both team, both players had an MVP caliber season. But let's look at what was Grambling's big deal, right? Because I'm just going to say that she could be coach of the year. I got to back that up. Before the SWAC tournament, I would have said this. And they won 23 games. That's the most by or the tie for the most by a first year head coach in Grambling women's basketball history. They won 23 games, which was the most since the turn of the century. I'm talking about since the 99 to the 2000. That was the last time that they won this many games in a singular season. And I'm not going to sit here and act like they were just trash or they were just garbage. Like, I'm not, I'm not doing that. But Grambling hadn't been at this level in some years. 
It had been some years since Grambling was able to perform at the level that they performed in 2024. And you have to give Courtney Simmons credit for that because they won, they won one non-conference game in 2023. One of them. Last year, they won eight, right? That's a big difference. That's a big difference. And it's highlighted by this biblical studies team that they knocked off. But I don't want that to be the story. It's it's one of the, the largest um, victories ever. But that's not the story. It's the fact that they came and they competed. And they won eight. They ain't played biblical studies eight times, okay? Just be clear with you. They did not do that eight times. Um, so 10 to 20, 10 and 20 to 23 and 10. You dive into the histories of it. The most wins in a quarter century almost, right? You're looking at almost a quarter century since they've achieved that level of success. This is the first tie for first. Okay, so this is the tie for first most victories by a first-year head coach. You put all of that together. You put all of that together. I'm telling you, Coach Simmons had one of, if not the greatest, first year season in Grambling women's basketball history to go from 10 and 20 to 23 and 12, right? To go from that to then go into the postseason play somewhere that Grambling has not been since 2018 to have the most victories in program history or excuse me, program history since 2000. This is a drastic change and you have to give credit to Courtney Simmons and they were second in the conference in scoring. And what's always interesting to me, right? What's always interesting to me is when you have a player or excuse me, we have a team that has a lot of success, but no true star. Like who's the true star on Grambling? I think there's a lot of really good players. Their leading scorer averaged 10.1 points per game. Like, like their, their leading score was the 20th leading scorer in the conference. This was the epitome of a team. They're second in assist. They do a lot of great things. They rebound the ball. They have the second lead in scoring offense. So that tells you how deep they are as far as scores. It's just not one star carrying the load. For me, that's the epitome of a team, and it's always interesting to see that. Um, they also got the automatic qualifier to the W in IT prior to Jackson State even playing, so I don't know how that was set up, but – they were already announced they're going to be in the WNIT before Jackson State played the conference championship. So that's pretty cool to me. Maybe that means Grambling would have. Is the WBIT a thing now? I think it is. I think the WBIT is a thing. It, it, anyway, this was a phenomenal season for them. Most wins by the program in nearly a quarter century. First year head coach comes in, has a coach of the year caliber season, takes a team and bonds them and has depth as scorers leads one of the best scoring offenses. This was a phenomenal season. It should be highlighted for Courtney Simmons. As we push forward, Star Jacobs is out of UAPB, and we ain't never seen her play for them, along with Kariah Beck. Both of these women have entered the transfer portal and are big blows to the Golden Lions. Today's episode is brought to you by Fire TV, and I love these things, man. Because they give me everything I could want. There's not a thing when I'm looking at my Fire TV that I say I wish they would have done for me, right? They suggest things for me. They give me my 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 usual. They have all of these things. And they also have the new Fire TV channels. And that's what's beautiful because in a little bit, you'll be able to see me on there on demand right now. I'm a part of the 24-7 Locked On Sports today that I bring up every day before segment two, right? I'm a part of that. So you can see me at random times, depending on if you catch me. But what you'll have the opportunity to do very soon is you'll be able to see your specific Locked On Sports shows on, on demand, whether that's me. I think Locked On Saints probably be part of them. Um, I don't want to give any other ones out that aren't the case, but you have all of these shows. All you have to do is go to your Fire TV channels. And I know you love Locked On. Just put it on the bigger screen, right? You're looking at me on your laptop, on your phone. Let's get it on the TV. Let's get it. Let's get it. Let's get it. But you have to go to Amazon.com slash Locked On Fire TV to learn more about it.
As we're wrapping up today's episode of Locked on HBCU, I appreciate you for making this your first listen of the day. Every day, making it all the way to segment three, and I thank you two times for that. Thank you. Thank you. Star Jacobs is gone and never has played. I don't know what her future holds. i am be honest with you. The report came out that Star Jacobs, the, when, the, when the report came out that Star Jacobs <laughs> entered the transfer portal, I fell to my knees like Dirk, man. And if you don't know what I mean, type in Dirk falling to his knees. If you're not a, a big rap guy, that's Dirk with a U. And I laughed because as I was thinking it, I started thinking about the image of Dirk falling to his knees. It's the funniest thing in the world, I swear to you. But that's legitimately the the, the reaction that I had. Dang, Star Jacobs gone already? And my first thought after that was we're never going to see Zay Green and Star Jacobs together. And I actually believe that's a crime. I actually believe that's extremely disappointing, disappointing because I sat there and I thought about Star Jacobs and Zay Green versus Diamond Johnson and Kiera Wheeler. Next year in the Vesco QQQ Classic, like that's something that I'm thinking about. That's something I'm really desiring. And then, boom, she leaves. She's never played. She came in, she missed this year with an injury. She's never played. But the thing that gets me is, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, I think she transferred prior to going to UTA. And then she came to UAPB from UTA, University of Texas at Arlington, right? Shout out to the home team. Um, the hometown, the home team is Texas Southern. You see it behind me. But the hometown is UTA. Um, I don't know. I don't know because there was already trouble about transferring twice. But now that you transfer three times, are we going to see her next year? She's going to have to sit out like th this is technically she, since she didn't play. Does does she not lose eligibility and no longer have to sit? I, I don't know. There's a lot of ways to look at this. I actually think that Star Jacobs for as devastating as it is to my outlook on UAP in 2024 slash five. I also just am confused. I also just don't know what's going on because of her situation. I think she transferred before. Like, I think she came from somewhere, transferred to UTA, and then transferred to UAPB. So now this will be her third transfer, and I don't I don't know how that works. People don't transfer that much on a Division One level. All of these schools are D1 schools. So maybe she goes to D2, and maybe she doesn't have to sit out there. I, I don't know. This is just very weird timing and extremely unexpected to me. I'm just going to be honest with you. This did not – this caught me off guard. I did not see this coming. Um, but also, Kariah Beck's gone. And Kariah Beck was a big-time scorer for UAPB. Right after Zay Green was Kariah Beck. She was the second leader in score, uh, scoring. She was high in assists. She was high in steals. Like, this is a player that is big-time. And it makes me wonder if Zay Green is going to go. And I, I think that there was a lot of drama at UAPB. I don't know everybody who was involved, but I know there were some people who were involved. And it makes me question if that drama midseason led to some of these departures. I don't know if Star was involved. I don't know if Kariah was involved, right? I, but I can only imagine that if they were involved, this will be a difficult place to stay around. I could see it being uncomfortable for some people. And we know there was drama because they fought each other on the freaking court, right? We don't have to come here with, here's, he say, she say, none of that. Like, I saw it. I saw them fight on the court. Does they Green leave? Did they leave? And maybe they, like, were they involved with Zay? I can't remember because they Green is the star, right? So anything she does under the microscope. <laughs> This is interesting to me. This is interesting to me. So Kariah Beck, Star Jacobs. Kariah Beck will be felt on the floor because you actually know what she brought to the floor. I think that Star Jacobs will be like, it's going to be like a silent letter. You know, it's the K and knife. It's the, it's the K and knife. You might not think about it when you say it. But when you see it, it's there, right? So I hope that makes sense. <laughs> I hope that makes sense. The only thing that makes sense is coming back and making this your first listen of the day every day. Tomorrow, we'll have Will Jones. Will Jones, former North Carolina A&T head men's basketball coach. He's coming on the show to discuss his time at North Carolina A&T. He gives me some details on his departure that I've never heard before. And then he also looks at the future of coaching and what he wants in a program on tomorrow's episode. I'm super excited. I can't wait for it. It's already been done. So until the next time that we hear each other, family. Y'all know to follow me on Twitter at South Exclusives. 
Take care. Stay blessed. Peace.